In the beginning, the Creator God said, Let me make man in my image, after my own likeness. And so God created man in his own image. Man was formed from the earth of the ground, where God blew life into man's nostrils. And so man became a living soul, endowed with speech. His name was Adam. But the Lord God did not wish for Adam to be alone, and so he decided to make unto him a helpmeet. And so God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep, and when Adam slept, God took away one of his ribs. And from this rib did the Lord God build upon, forming a being that would become woman. When Adam awoke from his slumber, he beheld the woman standing before him. This is a bone of my bones, Adam deemed, and it shall be called woman, for this rib from which she was formed has been taken from man. And with this Adam named her Eve, and she was the mother of all living. The Lord God blessed them that same day he created them, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth. And so the Lord God took Adam and Eve and he placed them in the Garden of Eden, so that they could dress it and maintain it. But God did caution his two creations, telling them, You may eat from every tree of the garden, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you must not eat, for on the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die. When God gave them this warning, he left them allowing Adam and Eve to enjoy the garden and all of its wonders. But all was not tranquil in the Garden of Eden, for there in the brush lurked the serpent, who God had created with man upon the earth. And the serpent came to them with ill intentions, seeking to incite man and woman to transgress against God. Has God really said that you should not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? It spoke first to Eve. And Eve spoke back to it, We can eat from every tree, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. On the day that we eat thereof, indeed, we shall surely die. The snake giggled to itself, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And so the serpent was able to entice and persuade Eve, who hearkened to its voice, and she transgressed the word of God, and took from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and she ate, and she took from it, and also gave to her husband Adam, who ate as well. So Adam and Eve transgressed the command of God, but God had already known it. His anger was kindled against them, and he cursed them. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. To the man, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Thereafter the Lord God drove Adam and Eve away from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from which they were taken from on earth. There Adam knew his wife Eve, and she bore him two sons and three daughters. She gave the firstborn the name Cain, saying, I have obtained a man from the Lord, and she gave the secondborn the name Abel, saying, In vanity we came into the earth, and in vanity we shall be taken from it. The young boys Cain and Abel grew up into men, and their father Adam gave them possession of the land. Cain was a tiller of the ground, and Abel a keeper of sheep. In a few years, the two brothers brought an offering to the Lord. I will bring rotten fruit from the ground to give to God, said Cain, 
for he did not wish to give anything that was of too much value to himself. I will bring the firstlings of my flock to give to God, said Abel, for he wished to honour the Lord in the best way he could. When God beheld the offerings, he sent down a fire to consume Abel's offering. Such was his appreciation of Abel. But upon Cain's offering, he sent nothing, for he knew Cain had brought only rotten fruit, and so did not respect him. Because of this, Cain was jealous of his brother Abel, and he sought a pretext to slay him. Sometime later, Cain and his brother Abel were out working in the fields, when one of Abel's flock passed into a space where Cain was ploughing, and ate from his crop. The trespass of this sheep gave Cain great quarrel with Abel. He approached his brother with great anger, and demanded of him, What is there between you and I, that you come to dwell and bring your flock to feed in my land? Abel answered his brother Cain, and said unto him, What is there between me and you, that you should eat the flesh of my flock, and clothe yourself with their wood? So the two brothers bickered about the land, about the animals, about their professions, and about themselves, until Cain grew angry, and he grabbed his brother and told him, What is there to stop me from killing you, and to end this argument right now? And Abel answered his brother, saying, Surely God, who has made us in the earth, he will avenge my cause, and he will require blood from you, should you ever take my life. For the Lord is the judge and the arbiter, and it is he who will requite man according to his evil, and the wicked man according to the wickedness that he may do upon earth. And now, if you should slay me here, surely God will know of your resentment, and will judge you for the evil which you have declared to do unto me this day. And when Cain heard these words which Abel had spoken, it boiled the anger within him. No longer could he hold back the resentment, nor the jealousy of his younger brother. And so, Cain hastened, and rose up, and struck his brother dead. With such a blow, Cain had spilt the blood of his brother Abel upon the earth, and the blood of Abel streamed upon the earth before the flock. What is this I have done? Cain repented, after having slain his brother and he was so sadly grieved that he wept over his brother with remorse. So Cain, who was ashamed of what he had done, tried to hide his brother's corpse, and so dug a hole in the field wherein he put his brother's body. Afterwards, he turned dust and soil over it. But the Lord God knew what Cain had done to his brother, and he appeared to Cain and said unto him, Where is Abel, your brother? And Cain replied, Am I my brother's keeper? I know not where he is. But the Lord persisted, and he demanded of Cain, What have you done? Cain was not the one to give an answer. Instead, it was the voice of his brother's blood that cried out to the Lord God from where he had been slain. You have slain your brother, God spoke to Cain. You have lied before me, but I knew what would transpire, because I saw it in your heart and saw all of your actions. You murdered your own brother for nothing, and because he spoke truly to you. And now, therefore, I curse you from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you next till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. You shall be a fugitive and vagabond from now on, and will wander the earth forevermore. After hearing the Lord's judgment, Cain went out from the presence of God from the place where he was, and he went moving and wandering in the land, away from all who belonged to him. Later on, Cain knew his wife in those days, and she gave birth to a son, whose name was Enoch, and Cain understood that though the Lord was once angry with him, he now began to give him rest and quiet. So in those days, Cain began to build a city, which he also named Enoch after his son. For in those days, the Lord had given him rest upon the earth, and so he did not wonder about the earth as much as he had done in the beginning. Then later, when Enoch was old enough, he had a child named Irad, and when he was old enough, Irad had a child named Mechuel, and when he was old enough, Mechuel had a child named Methusel. 
There are as many as five apocryphal books that go by the name Book of Jasher, all of which appear to have been forgeries or composed much later than biblical times. In this series, I chose to use the most accessible version of the Book of Jasher I could find as the basis for the narrative, which is translated from Hebrew and dates back to the year 613. Whilst I did alter the language, most notably the dialogue of the characters, you'll find that the framework and the story itself remains the same, as well as running mostly parallel to the events of the Old Testament. The Book of Jasher, known in Hebrew as Sapir HaYasha, is believed to mean Book of the Upright, or the Upright or Correct Record. What makes the book so controversial is that it was believed in some circles to be a lost book that is mentioned a couple of times in the Bible, most notably by Joshua and David respectively. According to Joshua, during the battle against the king Adonizedek, Joshua prayed for the sun and the moon to stand still, before proceeding to reference the book of Jasher. It is stated, And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jasher? Meanwhile, according to the book of Samuel, when David laments over the death of Saul and Jonathan, he also mentions the very same book, saying, To teach the sons of Judah the bow, behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. So because these two notable figures in the Bible reference this book, many readers and scholars have considered why this book isn't included in the Bible, and why it appears to have eluded us. In Joshua's case specifically, it's almost like he's telling readers that if they don't trust the words about the sun and the moon, then they should consult the book of Jasher, because what he's saying can be found in there too. With this, he not only acknowledges the existence of the book, but validates its importance. So it comes as a surprise that this very book that is spoken of has never really been identified, and with it emerges a gap in scholarly knowledge. But incidentally, it comes as no surprise that there would be several authors more than willing to plug that gap with a version of their own. As specified, I chose to use the 1613 version as the basis for this series for its accessibility, but I also chose it for the little nuggets of variation that are liberally scattered throughout the text. Indeed, whilst much of the content found here is parallel to the traditional Bible and follows the same story of creation all the way through to Joshua's conquest of Canaan, we do get some extra details that paint biblical characters in a new and sometimes dramatic light that we might not have considered from just the Bible alone. The most interesting difference between the biblical creation story and the 1613 Book of Jasher's version is that the latter actually omits the first few fundamentals. It does not mention God creating the heavens and the earth. It does not mention God separating the light from the dark. It does not mention God separating the waters, and it does not mention the appearance of sky and land. Furthermore, it also does not detail God's creation of the vegetation, plants and trees, nor does it mention the population of animals. Instead, the story just begins from the creation of mankind, as if mankind was first, when in actuality, the biblical account makes it known that man was the last thing God made. Now, it's also interesting that the book of Jasher starts with the conjunction and, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and God created man in his own image. It could just be a stylistic choice, but some might argue that there were prior creations to mankind intended for this text, but the narrator merely assumes that the reader already knows this, and so skips it. It might also be said that the narrator wanted to focus on the importance of mankind, and so, instead of leaving them until last, decided to prioritise them and make them the focal point. As there is no mention of God creating elements of the world on certain days, there is also no mention of God resting on the seventh day. In a way, by this omission, the book of Jasher implies that God had already made everything, and then one day decided mankind would be a good idea, and thus made him in his image. The biblical version does appear to be more detailed when it comes to the world itself, telling us of the four headwaters that flowed from Eden, and where these waters went. It's far more visual than the book of Jasher, as it illustrates the landscape of the world at the time, where the rivers flowed, and what some of these ancient places looked like. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is Pishon. 
it winds through the entire land of Havila, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Kush. The name of the third river is Tigris. It runs alongside the east side of Ashur. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. Once more, the Book of Jasher attempts to do none of this, choosing instead to ignore what the world looked like and choosing instead to focus its efforts on detailing man and woman. I suppose it's true that the Book of Jasher does lose that charming element that the Genesis tale has, where readers are enabled to imagine the Garden of Eden and how it was once populated with luscious greenery and frolicking animals. But on the other hand, it does gain a more streamlined and personal feel, as we the reader are thrust into the perspectives of Adam and Eve and share their novelty as they are brought into the world. Another interesting omission in the Book of Jasher is that Adam is not given the opportunity to name the animals, as well as to find a suitable partner so that he would not be alone. Genesis tells us, Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Instead, God in the book of Jasher simply decides that Adam was going to be lonely, and so creates Eve from his rib. We are told, And the Lord said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make unto him a helpmeet. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took away one of his ribs, and he built flesh upon it, and formed it and brought it to Adam. And Adam awoke from his sleep, and beheld a woman was standing before him. And he said, This is a bone of my bones, and it shall be called woman, for this has been taken from man. And Adam called her name Eve, for she was the mother of all living. Again, one might argue that the book of Jasher is much more streamlined. God, who is all-knowing, does not give Adam the chance to pick a partner from the animals, because he already knows Adam will not find one suitable. So the omission here is more sensible, albeit we do lose Adam's naming of the animals, which you might agree is an integral part of biblical understanding when it comes to nature. Genesis also gives us a reason why Eve was made from man's rib at all, and we are told this is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. In a sense, one of the reasons why man marries a woman is to complete himself, to reunite with his lost rib and form a union of one flesh. Incidentally, Woman marries man because she, the rib, gains the missing body and thus is completed in the same way. The book of Jasher does not give us this level of detail and poetic analogy. It simply tells us that God took away one of Adam's ribs and fashioned Eve from it. There is no reason given and again, it might be said that the narrator assumes the reader had knowledge of Genesis and thus chose not to mention it again. Chapter 2 of Genesis also concludes by telling us Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is another essential detail left out of the book of Jasher, for with this, we gain insight as to what mankind loses, or gains, when Adam and Eve betray God. After eating from the tree, they become aware of their nakedness. They experience shame. They suddenly know good and evil. Indeed, whilst the book of Jasher does emphasize the folly of man, it does not showcase the full depth of man's newfound perspective. All we are told is that they transgressed the word of God, but not that they were now different from the way God intended, corrupted by the serpent, and capable of feeling shame. Genesis once again gives us a more compelling view of how man felt during this moment, saying, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. In the book of Jasher though, Adam and Eve do not make fig leaf coverings for themselves, though indeed it can be assumed they did. Their nakedness is not something that the author dwells on too much, but instead again focuses on the misfeasance itself, that the serpent had deceived them and that they had eaten from the tree when God had specifically told them not to. Adam and Eve being naked and being aware of their nakedness might not seem like that big of a deal, but it actually does facilitate the progression of the plot, for Adam tries to hide from God in the Genesis account for fear of being exposed. What's more, when they do eat from the tree, Genesis gives us a conversation between Adam and God, who actually seems to try and shift the blame onto Eve, 
who in turn shifts the blame onto the serpent. And God said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. This isn't the case in the book of Jasher. God does not come to question if Adam and Eve have eaten from the tree. In fact, it is specified that he already knew it. We are told, And Adam and his wife transgressed the command of God, which he commanded them, and God knew it, and his anger was kindled against them, and he cursed them. I suppose you might say that this is more in tune with a deity who knew and felt everything. He's not surprised by Adam and Eve's betrayal because he's God. Thus, nothing can really surprise him. If he wanted to create mankind as obedient and unwavering, then he would not have given them free will. So indeed, whilst he is certainly angry, going on to curse his creations, he does not appear to be surprised in Jasher, much less does he require an explanation. The book of Jasher shows God cursing Adam and Eve, but not in the same way that Genesis does. Genesis is far more brutal and vivid, telling us that woman will have severe pains during childbirth, and she will belong to her husband, whilst man will have an arduous task of growing and hunting his own food. The book of Jasher gives us nothing of this, and simply tells us that God was angry, and that he cursed them. There are no specifics here, there are no details, and the whole curse is left feeling rather ominous due to the absence of its nature. Perhaps this was done for effect, but again, it's more likely that the author assumed the reader would know of the Genesis tale, and so fill in the blanks. An even greater omission occurs when we consider the serpent in the story. In Genesis, God curses the serpent first, which is almost like a knee-jerk reaction that really captures his anger. Like a parent realizing their child has been taken advantage of, God does not blame Adam and Eve initially, but instead chastises the perpetrator, the snake. We are told, So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Indeed, the snake is severely punished for its involvement. It becomes the most disdained creature above all livestock. Its entire physiology is changed so it crawls on its stomach, and it becomes destined to be crushed under the heel of man. In the book of Jasher, however, there is no sign of the snake being punished at all. After enticing Eve to eat from the tree, it slivers its way out of the story, and isn't seen or heard of again. Again, perhaps the author assumed that the reader would know of the fate of the serpent, and chose to leave this section out. But another idea could be that the author was hinting at the deceptiveness of the snake, showing us that he was able to enter the garden and bring about the fall of man, and also sneak off without anyone even holding him responsible. Genesis continues that, And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. This becomes one of the core reasons that God boots Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. They cannot be trusted anymore, and because they now know of good and evil, they would be more likely to be tempted to take from the Tree of Life. Indeed, they had already tried to become like God by eating from the tree in the first place, so it's reasonable to assume that they would try again. Secondarily, denying them from the Garden of Eden was also their punishment, for never again would they be allowed to enjoy the paradise that had been their home. The book of Jasher is again scant on these details, telling us abruptly, And the Lord God drove them that day from the Garden of Eden, to till the ground from which they were taken. When Cain and Abel are born, both stories seem to be parallel, with a few details differing. In Genesis for example, God directly addresses Cain after Cain becomes dejected that his sacrifice wasn't chosen. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. In a way, you might say that God offers Cain advice here, providing him with guidance over how best to lead his life. In some sense, you might say he's warning Cain, highlighting the two paths ahead of him, one where he kills Abel and one where he doesn't, the right path and the wrong one. 
As we know, Cain does choose the wrong path and ends up slaying Abel, and this little tidbit in Genesis does indeed foreshadow that eventuality. The book of Jasher, however, shows us no such interaction between Cain and God, leading us to believe that in this version, God had picked Abel as his favourite, and there was nothing Cain could do about it now that he'd already insulted God with his meagre offering. God isn't seen to tell Cain anything that might have otherwise nudged him onto the right path, and it might be said that such an absence of this interaction was because either A, the author did not think it was necessary to include, or B, because God in the book of Jasher knew what Cain was going to do, just like he knew Adam and Eve would eat from the tree, so he didn't bother trying to caution him otherwise. Now, you might be thinking that the book of Jasher appears thus far to be just a diluted account of Genesis, considering it's lacking many of the finer details, but here with Cain and Abel, we do get some more substance and character development between the two brothers than we do in Genesis. Indeed, Genesis simply tells us that Cain led Abel into the field and killed him, and we are left to assume that this transpired because Cain was jealous of his brother. The book of Jasher proves to be more certain, telling us that jealousy was indeed the reason why Cain ended up murdering his brother. We are told, And unto Cain and his offering the Lord did not turn, and he did not incline to it, for he had brought from the inferior fruit of the ground before the Lord. And Cain was jealous against his brother Abel on account of this, and he sought a pretext to slay him. What's interesting is that in the book of Jasher, Cain comes across as less like a premeditated murderer, and more like someone who is caught up in the heat of the moment. Despite seeking a pretext to slay Abel, he does not orchestrate an event where he is able to murder his brother, like in Genesis where he leads his brother into the field so as to kill him in private. Instead we are led to believe that the circumstances of the murder came about much more organically. We are told, and in some time after, Cain and Abel his brother went one day into the field to do their work, and they were both in the field, Cain tilling and ploughing his ground, and Abel feeding his flock, and the flock passed that part which Cain had ploughed in the ground, and it sorely grieved Cain on this account. And Cain approached his brother Abel in anger, and he said unto him, What is there between me and thee, that thou hast come to dwell and bring thy flock to feed in my land? As we can see, it wasn't Cain who led Abel into the field in this example, but in actuality, it was circumstance that led to their confrontation. Abel can be seen here to lead his flock into Cain's land, and though he does not have permission to be there, he allows his flock to eat Cain's produce. In some ways, you might say that Abel is at fault here, and that Cain had every right to be angry with his brother's lack of respect for his property. On the other hand, it might be said that this wasn't Cain's property at all, and that the fields were shared between the family. Abel might have been well within his rights to let his flock eat from the land, and Cain's reaction may have been irrational, and probably more in line with him seeking a pretext to slay him. In any case, this here is a conversation between the two brothers that we don't get in Genesis, Cain confronting Abel over a situation that might have been quickly resolved, had it not been for the resentment he felt for him. Abel does very little to defuse the situation, and proceeds to stand up to his brother. He tells him, What is there between me and thee, that thou shalt eat the flesh of my flock, and clothe thyself with their wool? Interestingly, we never actually see Abel even speak in Genesis, and because he is killed off so quickly, we don't really get to know much about him. Traditionally, Abel is seen as vastly generous, considering his offering to God, as well as mild and innocent, considering his profession and how he's blindsided by his brother. But here in the book of Jasher, Abel comes across as witty, bold, and perhaps even antagonizing. He does not try to apologize for his flock. He does not try to pacify his brother's anger, but instead appears to actually fan the flames, telling him that his flock might have eaten from his field, but the clothes his brother wears comes from his flock. In essence, Abel tells Cain that he shouldn't be angry that his flock is taking from him, because he's already taken from his flock in the form of their wool. This isn't all though, because Abel continues that, And now therefore, put off the wool of my sheep, with which thou hast clothed thyself, and recompense me for their fruit and flesh, which thou hast eaten. And when thou shalt have done this, I will then go from thy land, as thou hast said. So yes, Abel really does appear in this story to be headstrong, righteous, and more than capable of standing up for himself against his brother. He catches Cain in his own trap, reminding him that yes, his flock has eaten from his field, he has taken their wool, 
and fed on them himself. With that, Abel offers his brother an ultimatum. Pay me for what you have taken from my flock all these years and I will go from your land. As you can imagine, this does not sit well with Cain at all, who threatens his brother, telling him that if he killed him this day, who would even know? Who would even punish him for it? And Cain said to his brother Abel, Surely if I slay thee this day, who will require thy blood from me? Of course, Abel has an answer ready, an answer that not only destroys his brother's argument, but also promotes his own fealty to God. And Abel answered Cain, saying, Surely God, who has made us in the earth, he will avenge my cause, and he will require my blood from thee, shouldest thou slay me. For the Lord is the judge and arbiter, and it is he who will requite man according to his evil, and the wicked man according to the wickedness that he may do upon the earth. And now if thou shouldest slay me here, surely God knoweth thy secret views, and will judge thee for the evil which thou didst declare to do unto me this day. Such an answer only frustrates Cain. It isn't just the fact that Cain believes Abel to be God's favourite, and so of course God would take his side, but because his brother has outsmarted him once again. There was no way he could kill Abel without God knowing about it, and there was no way he could kill Abel without God punishing him for his wickedness. In a way, it's almost as if Abel is daring Cain to try something, because he knows that whether he lives or dies by Cain's hand, God will avenge him, and God will punish Cain for such a terrible transgression. By this point, Cain is enraged, and the book of Jasher is successful in building up that anger, and showing us the gradual rise of tension between the two brothers. Abel is not snuffed as he is in Genesis, but dies proclaiming the name of God, an honourable death, if you will, of a man who dies preaching what he truly believes. The book of Jasher tells us, And when Cain heard the words which Abel his brother had spoken, behold, the anger of Cain was kindled against his brother Abel for declaring this thing. And Cain hastened and rose up, and took the iron part of his ploughing instrument, with which he suddenly smote his brother and slew him. And Cain split the blood of his brother Abel upon the earth, and the blood of Abel streamed upon the earth before the flock. This account is far more dramatic than the Genesis account, which merely tells us, while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. We are then privy in the book of Jasher to another side of Cain, a remorseful side. We are told, and after this, Cain repented, having slain his brother, and he was sadly grieved, and he wept over him, and it vexed him exceedingly. And Cain rose up and dug a hole in the field, wherein he put his brother's body, and he turned the dust over it. Cain's remorse is not detailed in the Genesis account. He is not seen to mourn, grieve, or weep over what he has done, and whether or not he feels guilt is up for some debate. Indeed, we do see him tell God in Genesis that the punishment of being made to wander the earth is more than he can bear. But you could say that this was Cain concerning himself with only the consequences of his actions, not the actions themselves. But here in the book of Jasher, Cain is visibly upset. He is grieving, he is weeping, and he's even shown to bury his brother, perhaps in an effort to preserve his modesty. Albeit, this could very well have been an effort to hide the body from God whose judgement was surely not too far off. In the Genesis account, God appears to Cain and asks him where Abel is, and this is similar to the version in the book of Jasher, only we are told that God knew what Cain had done, as he had known all things thus far in the story. Yet, he pitches the question anyway, perhaps to see whether Cain would own up to it, or whether he would lie. And the Lord knew what Cain had done to his brother, and the Lord appeared to Cain and said unto him, where is Abel, thy brother that was with thee? Of course, Cain does lie in both versions, famously uttering, Am I my brother's keeper? The remainder of the story in both accounts seems to be synchronised. God hears Abel's blood crying out from the ground, and he curses Cain for what he has done, forcing him out from the land he knows, and plaguing him to wander the earth forever. Now in Genesis, we do see Cain try to protest the punishment, saying, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But in the book of Jasher, there is no protest, and it's as if Cain takes the punishment in silent acceptance, knowing full well that this is what he deserves. 
Therefore, God does not place a mark on Cain in this version, the mark being a symbol that warns every other human and animal that he should not be killed when he is wandering the earth, for this would end his suffering. Instead, Cain comes across as noble in his downfall, taking the punishment on the chin and getting on with it, as he leaves the land he has known. One of the most significant parts of the book of Jasher's account of Cain and Abel is God's forgiveness of Cain. This is not something that is detailed in the Genesis account, and as far as we know, Cain continued to wander the earth and live thereafter cursed. But the book of Jasher tells us that Cain, after sleeping with his wife and having a son named Enoch, God kind of took it easy on him. We are told, And Cain knew his wife in those days, and she conceived and bore a son. And he called his name Enoch, saying, In that time the Lord began to give him rest and quiet in the earth. To some, it might seem like a bit of a cop-out that after killing his brother in cold blood, in the end, he seems to get his happily ever after. He marries, he has children, and as the book continues to tell us, he ends up finding his own city, also named Enoch after his son. It spawns a debate over whether being cursed to wander the earth for eternity was really an appropriate punishment for Cain, and leads us to consider whether he should have suffered less or more. It also allows us to reconcile why no other biblical characters see or hear of Cain later on, for though he is cursed to wander the land thereafter, he never shows up again in Genesis, perhaps having head into his own exile to live out the remainder of his torment. With this idea in Jasher, that God had given him rest, it might fill that hole in that the reason why Cain is never seen again was because God did end up giving him respite, allowing him to settle down and live a normal life. But why does God do this? Well you might argue that God forgives. Going by the traditional religious belief, so long as one acknowledges God and repents for their shortcomings, God will forgive them, because he loves humanity, and though they may disappoint him, there's always a chance to redeem oneself in his eyes. Therefore, perhaps by this logic, Cain did truly repent, as we see him grieve and mourn in the moments after killing Abel, and so, after realising the error of his ways, and presumably surrendering to God, God forgave him and eased his sentencing of him. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Until next time.